And Father God, we thank you for a uh, young life. We thank you for those who are learning, those who are growing, those who are uh, progressing before our very eyes. And as uh, a seed is planted and as it uh, sprouts and as it brings forth, it blossoms and blooms, and we would ask for your blessing upon every life, that they might be your people, knowing you and serving you. Bless us all to profit from your word this morning, and we ask that you would indeed lead us into lives of obedience and much joy. In Jesus' name, amen. I thought of uh, this story, actually, while I was away and with holidays. You know what happens with the garbage collection and so on. And I miss the garbage, uh, <laughs> and we'll catch it the next time around. But I thought of the story of a woman who, who got up very early one morning, and, uh, and she was busy and so on, and she heard the garbage truck coming down the street. And she's, oh, my, I didn't get the garbage. And she, and she really is not very presentable. She's got... Uh, uh, an old bathrobe on, and she's got her hair on from those big curlers, and she's got cream all over her face, and she's got on an old pair of of uh, of, uh, of shoes, and and so on. She goes running out to the front, down the sidewalk, stops at the street as the truck pulls up, and she said, "Am I too late for the garbage?" And the, she heard a voice from someone reply, "No, just hop in." You know, <laughs> and I thought, you know, there are times in life when we all feel like we're not worth very much. We're like a piece of garbage, just a throwaway person. Not true, not true, not true. And as we come to the book of Corinthians, we are thinking about how we might be the best that we can be. Because if we are part of a church and we are the people God wants us to be, the church will be a happy, healthy church. And so as we turn to this book of Corinthians, we're going to be looking at it, and I think it addresses many, many issues that we face today as we deal with our lives. 2014 was a tough year, but with all honesty, as we view the news and the circumstances, 2015 is going to be harder and we're say, asking ourselves, how in the world am I going to get through? I just scraped through on 2014, and now here's 2015, and uh, I, I just am fresh out of resources. Well, what does God have for us that we would be a healthy church? Well, first of all, uh, God's word is always practical, no matter when it was written and to whom it was written. And when you look at this book of Corinthians, it is a very interesting book. It is part of the country of Greece. And it is part of, because of Roman conquest, a part of the Roman Empire. And as a result, you have in Greece three key cities. And each city makes a unique contribution to its country and to the word at large. And first of all, you have Athens. Athens was the place of uh, learning. It was the place of the philosophers. It was the place of secular insight and all of the great thinkers who uh, really uh, sort of started in uh, uh, organized fashion the whole study of philosophy. And uh, you had that place as being very key to the contribution to the country and to the world at large. And then you had also a second city, which was Sparta. Now, you know Spartacus and Sparta, and, and you're a Spartan. Well, that was a military center. That's where they had the armies trained, and that's where they had a residing army, and that was uh, the, the muscle of, uh, of the community, of the uh, province. And Athens was the brain, uh, this was the muscle, they had power, they could put down anything that came to them, they were there for law and order. And then finally you had Corinth, and Corinth was a very uh, prosperous city from a secular viewpoint. It was a business location, and they had all kinds of businesses that were thriving there. They had openings not only by land and uh, with uh, 
Uh, those traders that went through uh, over land, but you also had seaports that were available to them. They were able to grow and to develop their businesses. Now, they were making money, and money was the key to Corinth. When you lived in Corinth, your goal was to make all kinds of money. Now, when you have all kinds of money, you have money to spend. And when you spend it, you are enjoying life, and it is an entertainment center. And so they had the theater there. They had all kinds of things to entertain people. And they also had uh, what pleased their own desires and their own urges. And uh, it was a thriving community for prostitution. In fact, it was linked up with the worship of the love goddess. And so you, in the name of religion, you could practice your sexual activity, and you kill two birds with one stone, as they, they understood it. And as a result, it was morally very corrupt. And when Paul moves into Corinth, he understands only too well that this is, uh, this is party town. This is the place where people go. And what happens in Corinth? Well, you leave it in Corinth. You don't talk about it outside. It's all on the QT. And so as these people came in and enjoyed life and so on, he knew what he was getting into. And he knew that as he planted a church, the church would certainly assimilate or take in something of the environment in which he was found. So Corinth was a place where a church was planted, but a church with many problems. And the problems had to do with business. It had to do with relationships. It had to do with what do you enjoy doing in life? What do you do in your spare time? What are you getting a kick out of or whatever it may be? And so all of this led to a lot of shady activity, and we find even immorality coming into the church. Now, these problems certainly didn't enhance the ministry of the gospel. And Paul is really uh, the overseer of these churches, and he's doing the best that he can. He's one man. He's an apostle called of God. And he is there to not only see that the truth is proclaimed, but that correction is administered to people and that discipline is exercised because why should we preach one thing and do another and the world looks at it and, say, and says to us, you got to be kidding. You're not fooling me at all. You say this and you live like this. No, it's so inconsistent. I have no time for you or for your message. So as a result, uh, Paul is uh, knowing full well that he is coming into a correction circumstance. Now, if you were to correct an individual, how would you go about it? And most people, you know, it's a black or white situation. In fact, in our Sunday school class, we were talking a little bit, and that's what the police do. The police, when they stop you for speeding or uh, distracted driving or whatever it may be, they are really enforcing the law. And the issue is, uh, as you are pulled over and it, you realize you're exceeding the speed limit, that you were talking on your cell phone or whatever it may be, uh, and as a result, they, they go right to the heart of the issue. You have broken the law, and that doesn't really set up very good relationships with the people who have been offending. And as a result, you find that there is, it's a, it's, there's an edge there, and you become defensive. And you try to argue your way out, you talk your way out, you don't want to lose points, you don't want to ticket, and all of this kind of thing. Well, Paul is a very, very insightful man. He has not only learned from people, but he has learned from God. And he works as God works. And the first thing we need to communicate to a lost world is, do you know that God loves you? No matter how bad it may be, their transgression, their iniquity, that whatever there, do you know that there is a God in heaven who loves you? He loves you so much, he gave his son to suffer and die for your problems. Now, that's an entirely different approach. And as I mentioned in uh, our Sunday school class this morning, most people who are severe offenders morally or with regard to the law, or they know their life is a shady operation. Uh, they are people, the last place they would ever go to get help is a church. 
Why? Because the church is going to hit them right between the eyes with what they know is already true. Yes, I know. I know I'm a slave to alcohol. I know I'm a slave to drugs. I know I have problems and so on. And what they need is help. And they need what the Apostle Paul emphasizes here. Now, look at his approach. And he gives unto us three avenues that we can use in dealing with people, and it also enhances our own spiritual health and our own spiritual growth as we would be part of a church. So notice in chapter 1, he introduces himself, and this is so typical of Paul and the writings in their day, because when they wrote a letter, it was different from when we write a letter. Uh, you Now with email, it's a little bit different. You know right away where the letter comes from, from the heading, and so on. But under snail mail or penned correspondence, you had to go to the end of the letter to find out who wrote it, uh, sign sincerely, whatever, whatever, your name, and so on. But in these times, it's right up front. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, Sosthenes was a convert, and he was a one that had come to know Christ and was living for the Lord. And unto the church of God, which is at at Corinth, in them that are sanctified. Sanctified means set apart. Set apart for the glory of God. When you trust Christ as your Savior, you are giving your life to Christ. You are pledging to live for him, to honor him, to serve him. And God says, if you're a true believer and you've repented of your sins and you have a heart for me, I've set you apart for blessing, and I will be with you, and I will not leave you. Set apart in Christ Jesus, called saints, and every believer is a saint. You don't have to have any uh, trial or uh, hearing in the church by some uh, legislative body and decide how many miracles have you done, how this, that, then you become a saint. No, everyone is reckoned to be one who is saved, not by your work, but by what Jesus did. And as Jesus saved you, he made you to be a believer, an individual who is part of his family, and you are to live a saintly, godly life. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, he attacks the problem of their problems. And notice what's the first thing he says. Grace, grace, grace. Godly grace is so important in all of our lives. Uh, When we sin, when we disobey God and his word, and we know we're doing it because the Holy Spirit witnesses to it, and we deliberately, willfully step outside his will and go contrary to what he has directed us to do We have sinned. How do you feel after you have sinned? You made your choice on the benefit you would derive in this world and in this experience. But when you look at what you did in the light of what God wanted you to be and what Jesus did for us when he purchased our salvation, you feel terrible. You just feel like... uh, You know, I'm a misfit. I I really am. You move from uh, what should be the heights of enjoyment because of obedience to the depths of depression and discouragement because we have deliberately gone outside what God has said. Now, God tells us beforehand so we don't have to go through that. But we don't listen very well. We don't learn very well. And what we need to do is to listen and to read the word of God every day. And he will guide and mold and shape us. Now he says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, first of all, we need to appreciate and to know and to capitalize upon God's grace. What is God's grace? Well, you have heard by taking G-R-A-C-E, which is very, very accurate. It's God's act, God's work, uh, as a result of Christ. 
He, what Christ has done for us, has given unto us favor with God and what we need to be forgiven and to lead a successful life. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's good. And that's good to remember. You've probably heard it many, many times. Grace is what we need in life, but we don't deserve. And, and that's the worst thing, isn't it? You know, when you say, well, I really messed up. I made a choice. I went into this thing eyes wide open. Now, what hope is there for me when you do that? And we do it over and over and over again. But God is always there to forgive us, and he wants to grow us to the point where it sticks. Lord, never again, by your grace, will I be able to stand in opposition to you and your word. Grace is God's favor as a result of receiving Christ into our lives. Now, when you think about uh, the aspects of grace, and it is an interesting thing. Get a concordance sometime and uh, run down through all the references to grace. And there's grace for just about anything you would want to tackle in the course of life. Uh, to begin with, you know that you need grace for salvation. Are you saved because of the good life you've done and all the brownie points you've added up? And God says, well, this person's got more brownie points than they have bad decisions and wrong doings in their life. And so by works, they're going to be, no, no, it's never by works. We could never work enough. It's all a gift. Grace is a gift. Salvation is a gift. And it was provided because Jesus, God's son, loved us enough to come into the world and die for miserable, willful, sinful, heart-bound rebels that we are and say, I got a better plan for you. But you have to choose. You have to make the decision. And God, in the sacrifice of Christ, provides everything that we need in time of need. How can we make it through this year? Well, we make some good choices, but the, really the great source, resource and strength and power is from God's grace. God's on our side. He's there to dispense. He's there to meet. He's there to show. He's there to help. He's there to do everything that you need to do. And so just as in salvation, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is what? The gift of God. So when you fail as a believer, you've just refused to take what God gives for to you at no charge for you because Christ paid the price. He made it possible for you to be forgiven as a believer. And if you say, no, I don't want it, then that is a double rejection of what God has given by way of direction in your life. So as we sense in terms of grace, we're saved by grace. But we find out that we are also helped by grace in many areas of our uh, Christian experience. Uh, we know over in uh, John 1 and 14, we find that grace and truth, where does it come from? It comes from God. And how much do we have? God is full of grace and truth. You never exhaust the grace of God. Well, I don't, if I keep record of the times I come and ask God to forgive me because I'm a child of God and I messed up again, I, 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 God's going to say, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just out of, out of grace. You've exhausted my supply. No, no, full of grace. There's grace that really exceeds our sin and our guilt. That's what the hymn says. Mar- marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin, and our guilt. So you're on the winning side if you only choose to obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We know in Romans 3 and 24, we are justified by God, and we are declared righteous by what? By grace. He makes the decision because Christ covered the bill. And Christ suffered and paid the the 
uh, the tab here for us that we might be forgiven. And then you say, well, I, I've got some really tough things in my life. And uh, I don't know whether I can really make it. I don't think anybody has it as hard as I do. And I'm supposed to be on the victory side. Well, uh, let's uh, remember Second Corinthians chapter 12. You remember the struggle that Paul had? That was a struggle in the flesh. He had uh, a difficulty. He had uh, a thorn in the flesh. It was some kind of a physical ailment, whatever it was. I rather think it was eye problems. And uh, he had mentioned, well, you see what large letter I write unto you? That wasn't a long letter in the amount of words. It was the letters were big so he could see what he was writing. And I think he struggled with this. And he asked God to heal him, and he prayed three times, and God did not heal him. But he said, my grace is what? Sufficient for you. And God wants us to depend upon him. He wants us to trust him with everything. But Lord, I'm going into this new job, and I don't, I don't know whether I can do it. I don't know whether I got enough, you know, moxie to handle this situation or not. Well, my grace is sufficient for you. You do what I want you to do. You be faithful in walking with me, and I'll take care of your grace need, and I will supply. If you need help, I'll bring somebody along to help you. I will look after whatever difficulty you have in fulfilling your responsibility. His grace is sufficient for us. And so grace, we find out, always brings what? Mercy and peace. And when we say, okay, God, I need your grace, God knows that. He doesn't uh, discipline us for saying I, I, we need grace because we, fa we fouled up with him. No, he said, I will forgive. I will bring you into the fullness of fellowship with me because you've done the right thing. But I will give you grace, and on top of grace, I will give you mercy. And uh, it's like uh, uh, the Sunday school teacher was saying to uh, the little boy, you know, uh, tell me, do you know what grace is? And the little boy said, yes, well, I know. It's what God gives you when you need something and you've done something bad and he'll forgive you. Okay, do you know what mercy is? Well, it's something like God adds to grace, his forgiveness, what you need at the time you can't do for yourself. He gives you something extra on the side. And the little boy said, it's like when you come home from school and your mom is making homemade bread. And she says, son, would you like a piece of bread? And, oh, you're hungry and you came in from the cold and you're ready to wolf it down. And she takes a slice of homemade bread. She puts butter on top of it. And then she puts some jam on top of the butter and she gives it to you. He said the bread and the butter was grace, but mercy was the jam on top. And God is great in doing that. And he will do that over and over and over. He rewards faithfulness and trust in him. So never can we say, well, you know, God wasn't fair to me. He, uh, he didn't supply what I need. Anybody would, you know, just cash it in and say, I'm not going to try to live the Christian life anymore. No, it's there. But we have to accept it. And it covers everything. And uh, it's, it's interesting in uh, study and reading and so on. Uh, Philip uh, Yancey wrote a book uh, many years ago, What's So Amazing About Grace? Any of you people ever read that book? It's, it's a, a, a book of, uh, of uh, some time ago, and uh, I was uh, looking through it. And he mentions in the opening chapter, he said, you know, I thought of the grace of God and how, how could God forgive such, such awful, very plain, rebellious action against everything that he stands for. And he said, one day uh, I was uh, approached by a prostitute and this prostitute was seeking counsel knowing that I was a Christian and I wrote Christian books to help people and so on. And she said, I don't know what I can do to be forgiven of God. He said, what is your problem? Well, I, I'm on drugs. I have to support my drug habit. So that's what prostitution is about. I get money from prostitution, buy drugs, and so on. But she said, you know, and I'm so ashamed to mention this. She said, I have a two-year-old girl. 
And if I give the two-year-old girl out to men in one occasion, they, I can make more money than if I worked all evening long with a whole group of men. Because God's grace forgives something like that. If we are truly repentant, yes, God forgives. The most heinous of sins, murder, God will commit to us the word of his promise. And so we are to claim the grace of God. And you will never be able to stand before God and say, God, uh, I, I, I lived a lousy life because you didn't give me enough help. Anytime we fail, it's never God's fault. It's always our fault, and we have decided to do that, which is contrary to him. But then he goes on here. He says, you know, grace is uh, God's gift to us because we can't do it ourselves. And then he goes on in the chapter here, and he mentions a number of things which we can't get into, but just read down through. What does grace bring with it? Uh, these are the mercies that come along with it. Uh, he, he gives unto us uh, enrichment in verse 5. He will take something and he will grow it and expand it and make it to be a tremendous blessing in your life so that you will not only be able to talk well and explain the truth of God well, that's utterance, but you will know what you're talking about because you've had direct communication and experience with God. And then as you use grace over and over again, this is confirmation. This is anchoring you more solid in the faith. When you fail, every time you fail and go against God, you weaken your case for the next time of temptation. Every time you say no to temptation in the power of God's grace in his spirit, you are strengthening your hand. And that's what confirmation is. Use the grace of God. I cast myself upon you, Lord. I can't do it, but I plead with you. You undertake for me, and he will. He will confirm. He will substantiate. He will anchor you in the Christian life. And he says he'll keep on doing this until how long? Look in verse 7. Until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How long do we need his grace? Until Jesus comes, the trump sounds, and he takes us out of this world. No excuse, no excuse. The grace of God is given. Then he moves down. Now, he's, now remember why he's saying this. I'm going to help you with your problems. He hasn't mentioned the problems yet. He's saying these are the resources that you have in God, and they're available to anybody who trusts Christ as Savior and acknowledges their sin and begins to read the word and walk in the spirit and utilize the lifestyle that he's outlined for us. So from uh, grace, he then says, that's your enablement to succeed in this life. Now, if you're going to succeed in this life, what are you going to do when you succeed? Well, we look down and we find... In verse 17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He has enabled us to understand and to receive the gospel so that we can give it out to other people. Our ability to survive in the Christian life is by God's grace. Our task in surviving, the job we have to do is to give out the gospel. It's the only thing that works forever and solves any and every problem. You say, well, it doesn't work for me. Well, that's because you haven't been faithful. You haven't followed through. You've quit at the beginning. And if you don't follow through and be faithful to God, how is he going to bless you? And how is he going to undertake for you? And anyone is a fool to not take the grace of God. If you go your own way, your own willful way, you are bound for great, great judgment at the hand of God. And, and who knows what will happen to you? We know, not know what a day will bring forth. Uh, well, I was mentioning in the Sunday school class why the first storm we had, they were having accidents at the rate of 400 accidents an hour. 
and the police were running crazy trying to look after all these accidents and so on. And just this last little, yesterday, over 300 an hour. More than just, uh, you know, fender benders and so on, but one girl, little girl, was killed in a head-on collision. And the police said, and here's where they don't have much comfort, the problem is not with the weather, it's with the driver that drives in the weather. You've got to slow up, you've got to be careful. You can't tailgate, you can't drive like it's bare road. And they lay the blame where it is, upon the driver. So we understand, you know, these things. And here he is saying that there is available for us the great answer. And if it work for us, the gospel, to save us and to turn our lives into a profitable enterprise, then other people need it too. And you're the greatest witness. You know, who can deny what God has done in your own life? If God saved you and put you on a proper road and you're living a reasonably happy life and so on, well, that's proof enough to anybody. And so he says, the gospel is the job that we have. It's the only hope that people have. It's not the, it's not the counseling of this world. It's not the secular uh, understanding that men have dreamed up. And they have all kinds of crazy schemes. Uh, with, with the CBC, a sex offender who has not been charged or gone to trial yet, what did he have? He had a teddy bear, and when he did something questionable, he turned the teddy bear away and faced the wall. And that was in concert with a worldly counselor to solve his problem of questionable activity. So God's grace is available to us. And then he says, God's task for us is to give forth the gospel. It's the only thing that lasts forever. And it will take you all the way home to heaven. And then thirdly here, he's talking now, these are the things that you're going to need when you correct your problems. And he's hitting the positive side first. He says in uh, 1 Corinthians and uh, down in verse 17 now, as, uh, as we read, it's uh, not only the, the gospel and the heart of the gospel, and we don't want to miss this. The heart of the gospel, as verse 17 says, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. If you take the cross out of the good news of the gospel, there is no gospel anymore. You can't have the gospel without Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless Son of God, coming into the world and taking our sin upon himself, the innocent for the guilty, a substitutionary act. And here, as Christ agonized and suffered and died, and that's what we remember this morning, to purchase our salvation, the awesomeness of that sacrifice. He didn't deserve that. He didn't, was in no way responsible to come under our judgment, but he did it because he loved us. And how did he do it? He went to a cross, an agonizing death. Nails in hands and feet, sword in the side, and there to bleed out for us upon that awful cross. And if you don't have the cross of Christ, you don't have any gospel. Very interesting. In one of the books that I was given was a book on uh, the life of Billy Graham. And uh, in his early days, he went through a period of time and he felt that his messages were not as powerful as they had been. And uh, he was concerned about that. Uh, people weren't seeming to respond to the message. And a man came up to him, a learned man of the scriptures, and he said, Billy, he said, you know, I'm very concerned over you. He said, I've listened to you preach uh, in recent days. And he said, the one thing that's missing in your message is the cross of Christ. We need to do this. We need to obey God. We need to read his word. We need to observe what he has written. But you cannot do anything without the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the heart of the gospel message. And without the cross, we have no good news. We have no message. We have no hope at all. And so he concludes this 
opening chapter talking about problems, and he hasn't mentioned any problems yet. He will. But what does he say? He goes down through, and incidentally, he said, you know, one of the problems is divisions among you, and you just get fussing over people, and I'm a follower of Paul, and I'm a follower of another preacher, Apollos, and I'm a follower of Christ. How good can you get it? I followed him. And uh, certainly I'm better than Paul and I'm better than Apollos and their uh, witness and their ministry and so on and so on. And uh, he said, look, you're, you're really stumbling into the devil's territory. It's not baptism. And he uses that as an illustration. Baptism has a place. It's a way that we testify publicly that we've given our life to Christ. Death, burial and resurrection person says, I've given my life to Christ. He lives within me, and I trust in all of his provision for my life. That's grace in living out what God wants me to do by preaching the gospel or sharing it with other people. And so when I am lowered under the water, I am saying, I believe that Jesus not only lived, but he died. He died a real death. He was in the grave three days, and he rose again. And so you come up out of the water. It's death, burial, and resurrection. It's a public way to let people know you're a person who is now living for the Lord, and you're committed to God. Now, they are taking uh, a, a what we would call, it's not an ordinance, it's an ordinance, it's uh, really not a means of getting grace because of what you do. You get better and you get blessing from God and you get brownie points. No, it's just obedience to the symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection. And when you are lowered under the water, you're saying, I died to the old way of life when I trusted Christ. That's gone. That's history. And I died to that sinful existence upon planet earth and I'm raised to a new life in Christ. That's the way I live now. I live by the power of Christ who loved me and gave himself for me and he has given his word and he's given his Holy Spirit to help me. Well, in all of this, we find that there is uh, uh, how the devil gets in and he gets personalities and you get following certain preachers and certain people and it's everybody has a different gift. Everybody has something to give if they are in fellowship with God and truly saved. And we can profit from all of them. But then he says, all of this comes down to, okay, I am going to live by the grace of God and I have no excuse. His grace covers every problem that I have. I just need to walk with him and trust him. And then as I walk with him, I'm going to get share the gospel with other people. But what does the future hold for me? And he says in verse 31 of this first chapter, and according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Glory, 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 glory. What is glory? It's something that is done, something that is demonstrated in the life of a person which is a, a cut above, over and above anything of an average, and you say, wow, look at that. Isn't that marvelous how God enabled that person to accomplish this or that or the other end? Who gets the glory? Not the person. It's God that gets the glory. That, see, he says that no flesh should glory in his presence. We never, never go around saying, I'm a self-made individual. I made my own way, made the right decisions. Nobody helped me. I am, no, no, no. Somebody, you know, opened the door for you. Somebody gave you the break. Somebody loaned you the money to go into the business or whatever it was. You had help, help, help. You're just wiping all that out. And you say, I did it all by myself. We, not one of us, do anything of accomplishment by ourselves. And as Christians, we all get help from God. And so when God helps us, all the glory belongs to him. Uh, that's one of the great things in sport, that you see a person, you know, who a shortstop who feels a hot grounder and uh, throws it to second and over to first base and there's a double play. And you say, beautiful, that is the glory of the game. When somebody plays the game right, 
Or when they're charging down the ice, you know, and there's a pass, and then the pass goes over, and bang. The shot is made and goes in the upper left-hand corner, and the goalie doesn't get there in time, and oh, that's the glory of the game. That's the winning. That's the, the celebration. That's the great rejoicing time. And God says, this is what we enjoy down here as we live day by day. Uh, do you ever have uh, the aha moments, the, the wow moments in your life, you know, when you've been starting? Maybe you've lost something. You know, actually, uh, I was really concerned because going across the border, you need a passport or you need some kind of ID and so on. So I had uh, previous passports. I had documentation about how I came into Canada, da 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 da, da and so on. But I did not have my current passport and here I am pulling up to the gate and I pull up where is my current passport I can't find my per <laughs> and so on well anyway in the course of time and I think probably it's a bit of eyesight problem because I'm still working with an eye that's healing and it's kind of still fuzzy and whatnot but I looked over and I'll tell you, they're not going to let you in if you don't have a, pro a proper document to get you into the country. And I looked on the floor on the passenger side, and there, not with front side up, with navy blue against black carpet, what is that? That is the passport. And I picked up the passport, and I said, God, thank you. That's an aha moment. When you need something and you can't find it, and God steps in and provides it. You ever have anything like that? I mean, you know, you have an appointment, you know, and God, I got to get there. I'm, I'm running behind and I need a parking place. And somebody pulls out in front and you just pull in. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you. God is good. He's the God of the good things, the little things, the big things. That's all the grace of God. And we glorify Him. And that's the story of our life. If anything is done, if anything is realized, if anything is accomplished in the course of life, for good, it is all the glory of God. The glory of God. God made you. He brought you into the world at a certain time. He got you ready for doing whatever you were to do in life. And he wants you to honor him. And obey him. And he'll heap the blessing upon you. But if you're going to do your own thing. I'm not happy. I want out. I don't, blah, 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 and all you go. Rebelling. Rebelling. I'll tell you. You are destroying yourself. You're hurting a lot of other people. And we need to say. God forgive me. I want to get back. I want to get right. I want to give the glory to you. It's not me. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Wonderful story out of, uh, out of Western Canada. Maybe you heard it. It was on the, the news, secular news. And a man had purchased a, 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 a ticket in the lottery, and he won a million dollars. You hear about this fellow? He won a million dollars, and he was a druggie. And he said, boy, I've got it made now. And he went out and he bought his uh, drugs and he bought a house and he bought a new car and he had parties and so on and he was just living the high life and so on. And at the end of the year, he had not one penny left. It was all gone. And he was out on the street. Imagine blowing a million dollars in a year in that kind of thing. No long haul. And, and God brought him right to the place of absolute brokenness, and he realized the stupidity of my actions and my lifestyle and so on. And he got into a rescue mission. I think it was in Winnipeg. And he heard the gospel, and he gave his life to Christ. And he said, the first thing I'm going to do is go into rehab, and I'm going to get cleaned up, and this drug thing is going to go, and the alcohol thing is going to go. And he went in to rehab. He came out, and he was a fresh man, but he was constantly depending upon the grace of God. Today, that fellow doesn't have any money to his name to speak of, but he's the happiest man alive because now he works in the rescue mission, and every day he gets the the, the meal's ready behind the counter. He talks to the people, and he tells them, I am the happiest man alive. I don't need money. 
I just need Jesus. Jesus is the answer. And that's the gospel. That's the one who gets the glory. It wasn't him. It wasn't money. It wasn't his effort or his wise decisions. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ makes the difference. And all glory belongs unto God. And that is what heaven is going to be like when we stand before the Lord. And I don't think we're going to stand very long. We'll fall down on our knees and maybe on our faces and say, Lord God, I'm so grateful to just be here because you saved my soul and you work through me to accomplish whatever good is, has been done. And I give you the glory for it all. That's it. So remember that, that the grace of God is available for anything you face to do the right thing. And then you do the right thing and you're going to tell other people about Jesus. It changed you. It'll work for them. It'll handle any problem that they have. If you walk in obedience before and then give all the glory unto the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we cannot uh, contain ourselves as we think of the marvelous way that you were so gracious in leading us many times against our will to come to you and to come to that place where it was terrible for pride. It broke us down. We didn't want to admit it. We didn't want to say I was the fool. I've been, I've been running around in my own thing. I'm the most stupid person that ever walked the face of the earth to go against you and to sin and to live in rebellion against you and your will for my life. Lord, I want to change. I want to make that decision today. I want to really give my life wholly to you. And then shall I know the grace to keep the decision and the victory, and the way that you will lead in the days to come. And then I'll just sit back and say, look, don't give me any credit. It all belongs unto God. And we will give you the glory, both now and forever.